The first museum in America dedicated entirely to slavery opened just a few months ago. Michelle Miller traveled to Wallace, Louisiana and found a surprising history, not just about a plantation, but her own family. Michelle, good morning. Good morning. Well, about an hour's drive from New Orleans along the Mississippi River sits the Civil War era sugarcane plantation. The Whitney Plantation looms as a stark reminder that our nation was built on the backs of slaves. It's a tough part of our history to remember, but one man is investing a fortune to bring it all back to life. This house is full of secrets. They would sleep on pallets on the floors. And Beneath whitewashed ceilings, through quiet gardens, a dark history unfolds. Tourists peer into cages where slaves were beaten. Statues of black children stare back at them. In this sanctuary, memorializing the harsh reality of slavery, one figure seems out of place. Good to see you. 77-year-old John Cummings. Most people operate on ready, aim, fire, and I always operate on ready, fire, and an aim. 16 years ago, the New Orleans native and millionaire trial lawyer jumped at the chance to buy this 250-acre plantation without really knowing what he was getting into. Michael. What didn't you know? And I got to the slave part, and I saw some of the, some of the inventories from successions, and I was looking, man, 40 people just traded like cattle? And so then I discovered the oral histories, and that's when the light went on. I got something here. Well, I've got a great injustice here. Cummings decided to dedicate the entire plantation to the slave perspective. He spent $8 million of his own money collecting antiques and commissioning art. The vacant Whitney started coming back to life. I tell people when they say, well, why is a white man uh, involved in this. I'll say, well, don't you remember it was a white, white man who caused all of this. Here we honor the memory of uh, 107,000 people. Who to give it a voice, Cummings hired Senegalese historian Dr. Ibrahim Sek. It is just amazing how these people... Sek called in diaries and inventories from auction and estate sales. He found more than 100,000 names of slaves traded and sold through the Louisiana Territory. Each name is etched into these walls. There is no order, just like it was total confusion, that they're just like the lives of the slaves. You see, you have African names, French names, Spanish names. Next to those names are the narratives of the slaves themselves. Doesn't mean much, but we make them talk. It is just a way for us to give them a voice because these people were voiceless people. One of the voiceless, the powerless, was a slave girl named Anna who had a child named Victor. Victor was born a slave, but the records show he is the son of her white slave owner's brother. Victor's great-granddaughter is 82-year-old Sybil Morial. We didn't talk about it. Were they trying to save you from well, that? I, I, I have no, I don't know if it was shame, or maybe they were trying to save us. They didn't want to inflict that sad story on us. But it was sort of affirmed that my slavery ancestry was real, and it was only three generations ago. Morial only recently learned of her direct lineage, of her connection to the Whitney, and of Victor's legacy beyond slavery. He bought land and farmed it, so he overcame that life. And then the next generation did better, and the next generation did better, and then I'm, it's my generation, educated, successful. Morial was a civil rights worker, a college vice president, and the first black first lady of New Orleans. But I already knew that. I married her son, Mark. But how did you feel after you brought all of us together here? I felt that I had given you my family, the ancestry in color. So my children now know. They now know. They're great. 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 Grandmother was an African slave. Knowing can be freeing, but most often here, it is painful. 
One of the last sights are these sculpted heads, replicas of 60 men beheaded for their role in a local slave revolt more than 200 years ago. But Cummings wants people to realize we aren't that far removed. You look at the paper and you'll see that some militant group has uh, decapitated a French journalist. And we all wonder what kind of barbarians could do that. We did that. Americans, we did that. Americans with white skin, we did that. Do you feel guilty? No, only, only if I don't do what I'm doing right now. Over half of the people who come in here cry, and I cry. You still cry. I do. And proud of it. It affects me. The injustice is there. You really can't do anything about it to change it. But maybe you can change some of the effects of it. And that's what I think I'm doing. Just accepting that history can do that? Owning it. Perhaps John's most important point is that we, even today, are still living with the effects of slavery, poverty, illiteracy, and crime. And he's on a campaign to not only provide a quality education uh, in his state, in Louisiana, but, but he thinks it's really important that everyone who can go to college uh, and who can't afford it mm -hmm. gets, to go gets to go for free. What a story. Yes, oh my bravo, God. Mr. Cummings. This morning, I ask myself, when I look at that story, and I look at the first story we saw today, In South Carolina. and ask, is there yeah. a connection? Yeah. That's a question we all have to ask ourselves, yeah. um, each and every one of us, because then it opens us to the possibility of, you know, what our beliefs are, yeah. mm -hmm. certainly what our biases are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a question that needs to be asked. But I mean, Bravo, we all, we all Cummings, should question. Though, really, yeah. giving voice to the voices. And Michelle spending $8 million of his own money really shows a commitment. I was yeah. very touched by him. Yeah. And you yeah. interviewing your mother-in-law. <laughs> wow. Love her. Yes. I yeah. do. I love that woman. I know. She feels the same about Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great story. Thank you.